so uh, so far we have seen the definition of a limit as well as a co-limit it's an abstract definition using arrow categories and limits of any shape yes shape is usually denoted by j and the diagram is denoted by letter d and a diagram of shape j in category c is this functor d from j to c and then we saw what is the definition via arrow categories of what the so this arrow category delta arrow d where delta is the constant functor i mean it's basically the constant diagram functor of a given shape using that we saw how to like this how this topological idea of taking a rectangle and pinching one side of that rectangle can be used to construct cones and therefore now uh, we have this notation that in a cone we have uh, some some terminology that in a cone we have summits and we have different legs of that diagram and this is a cone over a diagram for a cone under a diagram the legs are below yeah they are going towards the summit the universal cone if it at all it exists that is called limit cone yeah and the universal cone under a diagram which if at all it exists like the universality is terminal for terminal cone for cones over a diagram and initial cones for cones under a diagram those are called limit or co-limit cones appropriately so if this limit uh, for different shapes of categories we have got different names of those limits and co-limits okay so that's our main idea now we have seen something like initial and terminal objects themselves are limit uh, so co-limit and limit of the empty shape then we have seen uh, the product for a product you take a two element discrete category as the shape then for equalizer we have seen equalizer is the uh, diagram of shape two arrows and well okay we probably haven't written that so today my first task is to write down a list a table sort of of different limits and co-limits and corresponding shapes yeah so some standard limits and co-limits so let us talk about some shape categories so shape category will be written here then the corresponding limit will be written here limit of shape j and co-limit of shape j yeah i mean i'm just going to give you some names of all these things so if j is the empty category then limit of shape j is called you tell me the terminal object very good i mean this is a table and the co-limit is called initial object then when it is a discrete small and discrete category then we call it a product and the corresponding co-limit is called a co-product so for example products in the category of groups are cartesian products of groups with pointwise operations and what are co-products they are the free products yeah usually you denote them by notation star yeah if you have done a course on algebraic topology then you would know these things better because in a standard group theory course these things are not covered anyway yeah so product is usually denoted by this like if this small discrete category is i in i then we will say that the product is product of some let's say objects ai is denoted by this okay for binary ones we uh, i mean i'm just going to write down this notation 
like for binary ones we usually write them like this then for arbitrary ones uh, this is the product notation yeah which is not surprising at all and for binary ones we will write a1 plus a2 and the arbitrary ones we will write summation ai i in i so usually you call it coproduct or sum even though it may not have anything to do with the sum that you normally think about yeah it's not sum in a group or anything it's not sum in a ring it just you are given a bunch of objects and then you want to construct a new object so uh, products have some maps from product objects to individual objects they are called projection maps now normally when you think about projection map then your intuition says that oh this is a surjective map but since there is no surjective you might want to replace it with an epimorphism but that's also not necessarily true okay so be warned that the projections are not necessarily surject epimorphisms and the coprojections which we denote by new as they are not necessarily monomorphisms unless the category is well behaved okay so this is the small discrete category when small discrete category contains only one object then the object itself is the unary product yeah product of ai where i is in singleton i yeah that is just ai itself nothing more nothing less when this i capital i happens to be empty then you get the terminal so terminal is always the zero array product and the initial object is the zero array coproduct so when we say that the category has finite products then you mean that it has binary products and it has terminal okay because from binary products you can construct usually construct the more complicated ones by doing this so i'm just going to give some explanation over here that generally if you are considering a three element product then we have two different ways of writing this you can take the product of a1 and a2 first and then a3 or like this but actually these these things are isomorphic in a unique fashion so both of them act as a product yeah because we know that limits if they exist they are unique up to unique isomorphism so this associativity law of products it holds up to a unique isomorphism okay let me also mention that terminals are terminal object is the zero array product okay another diagram that we are interested in is this this is the shape two objects two parallel arrows this uh, what do we call this limit the limit of this shape we have seen that already equalizers correct let me underline these so these are called equalizers so in equalizers let me remind you i'm just going to give you some parallel explanation over here that a cone over this diagram is something like this so this is let's say a this is b this is f this is g then a cone over this diagram has two legs yeah one leg for each object in the diagram and that must satisfy some properties that k is equal to fh and it is also equal to gh and therefore the k leg is redundant you don't have to write it but that k leg actually makes this diagram commutative like fh is equal to gh is actually hidden inside existence of that k which makes the diagram commute okay so these are called equalizers and if you do uh, the other side then what do you get the co corresponding co limit co equalizer 
It is important to take small discrete categories. Generally, when we talk about limits and colimits, then we only talk about limits of small shape. You can talk about limits of large shape as well, but that puts a lot of restrictions on your category. There will be only one result in our course where, where we'll talk about limits of any shape. Okay. Actually, uh, like uh, set theory will play some role in this. Yeah. So normally there is one property which will cover that right adjoints preserve limits. Yeah, we haven't covered adjoint mm -hmm. functors. And the converse to that is that whenever you uh, whenever there is a functor which preserves all limits, yeah, not necessarily small limits all limits, even large ones, then it will have a left adjoint. But yeah, the, that is a very strong condition and in, in reality, we can never check that. So that's why we do not talk about it. Okay, so the shape is this, small discrete category, you understand there are just some vertices and you don't draw identity arrows anyway. Okay, so let's come back uh, to this another shape. Now this is this shape has three objects and two arrows. These are pushouts, but pushouts whether they are limits or co-limits. They are co-limits. Yeah, these are pushouts, and it is interesting. So let me give you some notation for writing pushout. Yeah, so suppose my diagram is this. A, B, C and F and G are given. Then what will be a push out? Push out will be a cone under this diagram, which means I have to draw something over here. So I'm just going to use the letter Q to draw that. Okay. Then it will be three maps. Uh, let me label them as well. So this one will call H, this one will call, call K and this one will call L. Now three maps and because this is a cone under the diagram, yeah, what are the properties that these triangles must commute? For every morphism in the diagram, the legs must commute. So therefore, we will have the property that H composed with F is equal to L. And L is also equal to K composed with G. Okay, so whenever there are uh, legs, they commute with the morphisms in the diagram. Now, what does that tell you? Is there any redundant leg over here? Yes, which one? Yes. L. So, we can, we might as well forget it. So, push out is simply going to be a pair of maps such that HF is equal to KG and that's all. Okay, so I can get rid of this L and uh, the notation like the standard way of writing push out is like this. Okay, I'm uh, giving you this part like if Q is the push out, the notation is you add this right angle over here. That's how you denote that this is a push out diagram. And the notation that does the formal notation that we write for this is something like this. Uh, like for this particular diagram, we will say it is B plus C over A. Yeah, it's not just sum of two things, you have got some restriction to the sum. So th that's why this notation. This shape, shape diagram, this is called a span. Okay. So the co-limit of a span is called a push out and this is the notation. Now dually uh, we should be interested in what are the limits of the shape called. 
Now, if you have heard some terms like fiber products or pullbacks, then they are not limits of this particular shape. Actually, the limit of this particular diagram is useless. Let me show you how. Suppose, I mean, I'm just drawing the same diagram over here. Yeah, this is my working space. Let me just open it up a bit. This is my F and this is my G. What will be a limit cone over it? It will be some object D with these three maps. Okay, these three maps, they will form a cone over this diagram. Now, let me uh, label them as H, K and L again. And what is the connection between H and L? G composed L is H. So, uh, similarly, F composed L is K. So, do I really need to know what H is? No. I don't need to know what H is. I don't need to know what K is. It's enough. Like, these are redundant legs. I'm just putting a cross over them. These are redundant. We don't need them. So, only L is sufficient. But L itself... If only one arrow is sufficient, then what will be the limit? The identity, not the initial object, the identity arrow of that particular object A. So, A to A is the terminal cone. When L is just the identity on A, then every other such cone will factor through that. So, therefore, limits of this shape are useless. Yeah, whenever the diagram itself has one particular source, then and nothing else is happening, every other arrow is determined by them, then we don't have any name for that. Dually, we will have cospans and cospans are uh, denoted like this. Span as in you understand, like this is a fan-like notation. Yeah, it's spanning out. And co-span is everything is coming together to the same thing. So, this is called a pullback. You again use a similar uh, perpendicular notation, right angle notation. And usually you would call it like, let me draw one here, like... Mm. So, suppose I have A, B and C, yeah, this is the diagram, this is my F and G, then a pullback P will be denoted like this. Like, what is the universal property here that whenever you are given any pairs of arrows such that the outer rectangle commutes, then there exists a unique arrow over here such that the triangle commutes, both triangles commute. So, this is a pullback. So, these are some standard limits which are finite, like they are finite shape categories so far. Yeah? Huh? Oh, it's notation, yes, thank you. So, the notation for this particular diagram, I will say it is a. Uh, it is A cross B over C. Okay, so there is some restriction. It's not just a product. Yeah, it's a product with some restriction. And this particular viewpoint is going to be useful for us in just two minutes. Okay, so another shape that we commonly consider and you must have seen this in practice, that is natural numbers with respect to less than, less equal. So, what are diagrams of this shape? It is a sequence of objects, A0, A1, A2, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, this is a sequence of objects such that from any AI to AJ, where I is less than J, there less equal J, then there is a unique arrow unique composition possible. Yeah, so this particular shape is also important 
Now, if you remember my argument about span, spans having no lim interesting limits, the same argument works here. There is no interesting limit because the limit is always going to be the identity arrow in the on the first object. A0 is the is our beginning thing. Maybe I should uh, make some more space and draw something over here. Okay, so this is a, something like this A0, A1, A2. What is the condition? Like this is A0, this is A1, this is A2 and dot dot dot. What is the condition that I mean, it's just a uh, sequence of ob objects and maps. Yeah. In practice, like you might have seen something like this. So, for example, we are talking about a category of sets. Yeah. Let's say A0 is singleton 0, A1 is 0, 1, and its inclusion map, A2 is 0, 1, 2. Yeah. Just our standard natural numbers, and we have inclusion map. Then what will happen eventually if you continue going, it will be omega, yeah. So it will be omega, the eventual thing that will happen that is called the co-limit, yeah. This is the co-limit actually. So the limit of this shape is not interesting, but the co-limit is, so usually we denote it by A infinity and what will this A infinity satisfy? There, I mean this is the summit universal cone under the diagram. So it will have bunch of maps over here. This is F0, this is F1, this is F2, this is and dot 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 such that all these triangles commute. Yeah, so there is a lot of data to take care of. See, uh, when we are talking about let's say the standard example like natural numbers 0, 1, 2, 3 and take their sequence of inclusions then what is the union of this sequence? This union is called a directed union. And as he pointed out, this union is omega. But we might as well have written rational numbers. All these natural numbers are also contained inside rational numbers. But that's like inclusion in rational numbers that just any other cone under the diagram. But the universal way is the directed union and that is natural numbers. Okay, so for any other D, what we say? For any other D with a choice of maps G0, G1 and so on, there must exist whenever these all triangles commute, then there must exist a unique map such that it makes the F and G uh, things commute with this particular arrow. For in case of rational numbers, this sequence has a limit means what? I mean uh, that D, that A infinity, that doesn't always exist in the case of like the natural order for rational numbers. I mean is there an analogous case? Yes, of course. So these are monotone increasing sequence. If you are considering just real numbers, yeah, real numbers, think of them as a poset. Yeah. And uh, less equal relation is your arrow. Then capital A0, capital A1, capital A2, these are simply real numbers. And little A0, little A1, they tell you that this is a monotone increasing sequence. Sir, so is there a categorical way of defining completions? Categorical way of defining completions, yes. So how do you complete? That's a good question, yeah, like theoretically. Uh, how do you complete rational numbers to get real numbers? You add the missing limits. So category theorists have adopted the same name. A category is said to be complete if it has all small limits. And we can force, forcibly complete it under any limits that we want. Yeah, we formally add them. But by the way, we are even though we are talking about limits of monotone increasing sequence of real numbers here, we are actually talking about a co-limit. This is a common uh, difference in nomenclature. So please pay attention here. I am going to say that these are called 
like the correct name for them are directed co-limits. Why directed? Because natural numbers have a direction. Something is happening. Yeah, it's a direction. Zero, one, zero step, one step, two step. It's happening eventually. But in practice, the thing that you will see, people call it direct limits. Yeah, people who are not category theorists, they often call them direct limits. But direct limits are not categorical limits, they are co-limits. Okay, so always remember this. And some people also call them inductive limits. But the common uh, notation for them is this. Yeah, limb with an arrow increasing. In that direction, something is happening. On the other hand, if I reverse the shape, of this particular category, like I am just going to take op of this, then the co-limit of that shape is not going to be interesting at all, but the limit will be, and that limit is called, I mean, uh, in practice it is called inverse limit, it's also called projective limit, And it is denoted by this particular diagram, uh, like limb with inverse arrow. That's why inverse limit. But please remember that in uh, direct limits are not categorical limits. They are co-limits. So direct limits will give you a notion of monotone increasing sequence, whereas inverse limits will give you a notion of monotone decreasing sequence. Now you have to uh, think about these things like uh, you, something is happening, yeah? we are conducting let's say an experiment and then at zero stage, yeah, before we begin the experiment there is some state of the system. Then at A1 some transformation happened, at A2 some transformation happened. And then, what we are interested in, we cannot wait for the system to unfold for infinite amount of time. But we are usually interested in determining what will happen at time infinity. Yeah, what will happen eventually. Now, I will give you one particular example. Like that's why in category of sets, yeah, I am not talking about... Uh, this, uh, just the numbers themselves. So, I am saying that the empty set, then 0, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe I, uh, okay, I should not use the set theory notation if everybody is not familiar with that. But what is this? Singleton 0, 1, then 0, 1, 2, then 0, 1, 2. And now they, this is just inclusion, inclusion, inclusion. Now, if these are my A0, A1, A2, then what will be A infinity? We have already established that A infinity will be omega, which is natural numbers. Yeah, let me just call them natural numbers. But something you need to observe here. Give me some natural number, 10, okay. So, 10 did not appear in first 10 steps, but eventually it appeared and it continued to exist from that point onwards. So, it may happen, yeah, I mean this is a sequence of inclusions, but sometimes it may happen that it continued to exist for some time, then it ceased to exist. Yeah, it stopped to exist after that. Like some morphisms, these morphisms which we are taking, those morphisms might eventually identify two things in the direct limit. So, if something persists for a long time, 
then only like until eternity then only those things appear in the direct limit so direct limits will give you a sense of future like something will happen in the future and it will continue to exist whereas i mean that that's why this is usually very easy to understand yeah we have a sense of building something new from its fragments whereas in practice thinking about the past is difficult so a similar explanation about inverse limits is that something that used to exist until some point in the past and then probably it stopped to exist afterwards so the same inquiry in the past is what is inverse limit now i will give you another sequence like this is also inclusion over here but uh, i'll give you another sequence and not tell you what those names are you need to figure them out for yourself in group theory yeah now in the category of groups we are talking about these the uh, these two sequences the first sequence is i start with zp then zp z mod pz okay uh, let me write that z mod pz then z mod p square z z mod p cube z and so on now z mod pz embeds this it's a cyclic group with p elements it embeds inside the cyclic group with p square elements yes so there is an inclusion 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 and dot 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 what will be this direct limit and similarly now i am giving you another sequence where we are taking surjections okay so over here we have to take direct limit over here and inverse limit over here one of them is called the group of periodic numbers the other one is called the proofer group proofer pre group now i'm uh, i'm just giving you the names okay it's your job to figure out which one i'm talking about yeah which one is the direct limit which one is the inverse limit do you understand the map from z mod p square z to z mod p z it's simply the remainder map whereas the inclusion is like you plot all the roots of unity on circle and then you will just get more points the earlier like already existing points will continue to be there any p root of unity is also p square root of unity so these are two different names and you should figure out which one like now by by giving you these examples my uh, motivation my goal is just to tell you that these things are commonly used in mathematics i'm sure you have heard of periodics somewhere periodics are direct limits and proofers are inverse limits are you sure why that's periodic i will ask you to just confirm your answer okay i'm not going to disclose the answer but do you understand directed co limits these are usually easier to understand because they are about the things which happen in future and we are building them but inverse limits are really notorious yeah it's even difficult to imagine what they could be i mean the standard name for them is is co directed limits i will make these things precise what is a directed set and co directed set precise sometime later in the course 
so my uh, I, idea here is that uh, natural numbers are not the only shapes which are interesting but there are other shapes which have a similar behavior that eventually everything just agrees any questions so far i am just going to put two question marks here maybe in the next class you will tell me for sure what what they are okay very good so we had done something more and i don't know why it is appearing here okay let me uh, go to the next thing so ha huh. if so i'm i'm just going to talk about some uh, some theorems now there are let's say the first one that if a category c has products and equalizers then i mean maybe i'll call it zeroth version yeah this is a motivation then it has pullbacks if a category c has products and equalizers then it has pullbacks so basically now we are trying to study the interrelationships between different types of limits let us try to do this by leaving some space yeah there are there is statement 1 and statement 2 which are the most important things but let's try to prove zero first from products and equalizers we can construct pullback so what is a pullback let's draw the shape yeah we have a b and c and we have a pair of maps f and g we want to construct its limit but we don't know whether it exists or not we need to construct some kind like we have to use products and equalizers to convert it into something different and we argue that that one exists so if you like graph theory then or just manipulation of objects then this is a good exercise for you you convert this diagram into an equalizer diagram by using products very good a cross b projections okay but i just need one object over here target object i need two arrows and G G will compose with pi two. Yeah, we'll first do pi two and then we'll G and pi one and F. Okay, so A cross B to C. We have got these two maps. Now we just have to verify that if we take something over here, like the equalizer of this particular diagram, what does the equalizer do? Well, equalizer is going to be a pair of maps, any map into a product. is a pair of maps so i am just going to say this is e1 comma e2 and then there is a last something uh, that thing is irrelevant yeah that leg of equalizer diagram is always irrelevant so what what condition do we have that f pi1 e1 basically is equal to sorry f pi 1 sorry i should uh, write everything f pi 1 even e2 is equal to g pi 2 even e2 but what is pi 1 composed with even e2 just e uh, even so this is f even and this is g e2 so basically i can complete this diagram by writing e and then taking little even here and little e2 here and the universal property of e as an equalizer will give you the universal property of e comma even e2 as a pullback please verify this i will give you a second exercise which is also quite simple 
yeah this is we are calling it a theorem if a category c uh, no i i can't give you this second exercise let's do the hard one if a category c has all products and equalizers then it has all small products yeah i mean when i when i say all then i mean all small products and equalizers then it has all small limits so it's a generalization very high level generalization of the first statement like zero statement so let's try to prove this now this is definitely going to be very abstract yeah because we are saying that it has all small limits which means we have to start with any arbitrary shape and then construct one equalizer diagram using lots of products so let j be any small category and d from j to c be a diagram okay so we are given any diagram of shape j where j is any arbitrary shape now we have to construct one equalizer diagram now the entire proof simply depends on one diagram category theory is all about diagrams yeah so we have to construct only one equalizer diagram so equalizer diagram means there should be two objects and a parallel pair of morphisms those two objects yeah now uh, that's going to be so interesting so form this particular diagram a big product over all dj's where j is an object of g so in the original diagram yeah let's suppose what what we are doing in the uh, in the zeroth diagram how many of j's are there in the shape shape of this diagram how many j's are there three it's a b and c there are three objects in the cospan category so therefore we are taking a three uh, three term product yeah three ary product it will be a product of a cross b cross c so we are not exactly constructing a cross b we are constructing something much more okay so a cross b cross c and then another thing that we construct the other massive product that we construct that is the product of d of codomain of alpha where alpha is a morphism of j so once we took all like product indexed by objects of the shape category and second time we are taking product indexed by morphisms of the first category okay now we have to write down two different maps from this to this okay before we write these maps what exactly do we mean by writing maps from a product to another product we are landing inside a product but landing inside a product means that whenever you take its project uh, composition with the corresponding projection map yeah like there will be a projection what will this projection be called like onto d of codomain alpha hmm? pi alpha very good so we have to describe what happens when i take the projection uh, the composition with this projection so let me call these two maps f and g and now i have to describe what happens when i take where yeah i mean i'm just going to 
talk about this. So pi alpha of f. Now what can you do? You are starting with a massive product. Hmm? And you want to arrive at the codomain of this alpha. So pi alpha of f is defined to be, I mean you don't do anything, you just say, okay, I'm going to simply project onto codomain of alpha. This is my map. Can we do that? Yeah, codomain of alpha is a is one particular object of the shape category. So we are declaring that going from here to here is nothing but, well this map is just, I take the projection onto that particular component or there is another option which is quite easy like you could have guessed it if, if you think hard, hard enough that no, I, I will first drop down like I know alpha. I can first drop down to the domain of alpha and then follow through, through the image of alpha in the diagram. Okay, so therefore I can say pi of domain alpha followed by d of alpha. d of alpha is some arrow in C. Okay, so we have got two different maps which land me inside the same thing, same object, D of codomain alpha. These are the obvious two choices, yeah, we can't do anything more. Is everybody convinced or everybody is confused? See in the original diagram what we did, how many morphisms are there in the original diagram? Let me use green arrow. How many objects are there? Three. So let me write that down for you. A cross B cross C. And how many morphisms are there? Two is the wrong answer. There are always identity morphisms which even if you do not see, they are there. So there is, and we have, we have to list all the codomains, the targets of those arrows. So there are five arrows, first identity of A, then identity of B, then identity of C, then F and then G. These are all the arrows of the, uh, the sorry, these are all the objects of codomains. Now I am giving capital F and capital G. I should say that our original diagram is one 2 and 3. Let me call this beta and gamma in this diagram. This is beta, this is gamma. Okay, so there are three morph, uh, three objects, 1, 2 and 3. They give me this and then there is identity on 1, identity on 2, identity on 3. Then I have beta, then I have gamma and I have got five projection maps, first one corresponding to identity on one, which is going to A. Then second one corresponding to identity on two, which is going to B and identity on three, which is going to C. Then beta, pi beta, I mean all of these are projections. And this is finally pi gamma. So let's do it for beta. For beta what I am saying that pi beta of capital F is equal to pi of like codomain of beta. What is codomain of beta? Just 3. So pi sub 3. Yeah, pi sub 3 on the domain is A cross B cross C. So, pi sub 3 is just projection map onto C. And what is the last one? Uh, the second one, sorry. 
वॉट इज पाए बीटा ऑफ कैपिटल जी दिस इज यू फर्स्ट टेक प्रोजेक्शन ऑन टू इट्स डोमेन विच इज पाइसअप टू राइट पाइसअप टू इज ऑन टू ए सॉरी पाइसअप वन पाइसअप वन एंड देन फॉलो डी ऑफ बीटा वट इज डी ऑफ बीटा दिस इज आवर ओरिजिनल डायग्राम ओके दैट वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट सो फॉलो एफ सो एफ एंड देन पाई ए पाई वन so we are coming to a and then following f and the fir first one was you simply go to c ha huh? small f is coming from this highlighted diagram at the top yeah i mean if you want i can write it here again this is our category j and this is my diagram yeah my diagram looks like this Yeah, so you can make sense of the corresponding arrows. So D of beta is F, D of gamma is G. Okay, so <clears throat> they, these are two different routes. Yeah, if I want to go from A cross B cross C to C, then I am either directly going via projection or I am first going to A and then following F. these two are different ways of going there and we have done that in this original equalizer diagram yeah f pi 1 and g pi 2 they serve similar purpose okay so let me come back to the main proof you you should verify all these things for yourself for a small enough diagram then only you will understand what's going on so uh, let's come back to the main proof now so we have defined two different maps now i'm just going to use this blue color again and we have got these two maps f and g and we have said what is their effect with like composition with projection maps yeah there are two natural choices to do and this is a an equalizer diagram so since c has equalizers let l to this product of dj and i am going to call it e j in objects of j b the equalizer of star where star is this particular diagram the equalizer diagram so if we have this equalizer then what really happens okay then first of all observe this for any arrow alpha of j d alpha composed with pi of domain of alpha followed by e okay so e is this map yeah we have appended this l over here i am just going to draw it in by this okay so d alpha pi domain alpha what is that we have seen that part yeah that is d alpha pi domain alpha it is the definition of pi alpha composed with g so this is pi alpha composed with g and then e right so what i use like i parenthesized it like this then i parenthesized it like this so i can write it by using associativity of compositions i can 
take GE together, but GE is same as Fe. So therefore, this is pi alpha Fe, but that is same as pi alpha F E, which is pi codomain alpha E. Okay, what did I write exactly in this expression? I showed to you, no matter which path we take, we always reach the same thing. That is what is called that there is a cone over the diagram. Okay. So, what did I say? So, uh, IE pi j e where j like l comma pi j e where j is an object of j form a cone over diagram D. Yeah. That we have L as the summit of a cone over the original diagram. Okay, maybe you are lost. I will go back a bit. What did we start with? We want to show that if it has all small products and equalizers, then it has all small limits. We started with an arbitrary small shape category J and we started with an arbitrary diagram. But we were not talking about the limit of that diagram. We constructed these two massive products and we constructed an equalizer diagram and we took the equalizer. So equalizer is the limit of that equalizer diagram only. Now what we are trying to show that the equalizer diagram is gives you enough data to construct a cone over the original diagram. Original diagram is D and that's precisely what we just argued. What do we do? It's always pi j. Yeah, from, from the summit, it's always you drop down to an object and you follow a morphism in the diagram. That's same as going directly to the codomain of that morphism. That's what we said. D alpha composed with pi domain alpha composed with E is pi codomain alpha composed with E. So it forms a cone over this diagram. Now what else is remaining to show? It's a cone. But we have to show it's a limit cone or a terminal cone. So let theta uh, like I mean, uh, I can complicate the matter by saying theta from de delta to d, i.e., uh, let me say a to theta j dj, j in objects of j. Yeah, let this be any cone over d. Okay, so now we have started with any cone over diagram D and what we are supposed to show that it factors through the limit cone, the one that we have already constructed. And how we are going to do that? We will transfer the data that this is any cone over D. So we will argue that it gives me a cone over the equalizer diagram. And then by the universal property of L, L comma E as the equalizer, we will show that it factors. So that's our method. Okay, let this be any cone over D. Then, okay, uh, this is over any, uh, like over the diagram D. Then there is unique theta bar from A to this massive product. Yeah, what is the product of the of this this one? 
you remember this is the source of the equalizer diagram yeah because you have all individual project uh, compositions with projections so that data is combined into a single map this is just the data of products yet yeah we have maps onto each dj we collect them in the form of a single map yeah this is what we write by a tuple yeah when we say there is a map to a cross b then it is f comma g that's what we write yeah so this is a tuple map theta bar is the tuple map and uh, what property does it satisfy it's the projection map uh, sorry it's the uh, product map to a product so pi j of theta bar will be equal to theta j yeah for all j in objects of j you understand this okay good so uh, so now we have at least obtained one map now we have to show that this theta bar behaves nicely with respect to these f and g so f theta bar is equal to g theta bar we have to argue then we will get what we need okay so uh, now we argue f theta bar is equal to g theta bar how do we show something like this f theta bar and g theta bar they are both maps onto this huge product but we cannot show it directly we always have to compose it with projection maps then only we can show yeah so for any arrow alpha of j okay what is pi alpha f theta bar well pi alpha f we already know that is pi codomain alpha followed by theta bar but theta, we have already seen pi sub j composed with theta bar is theta sub j so therefore this is theta sub codomain alpha but theta itself is a natural transformation so this will turn out to be d alpha composed with theta domain alpha but what is theta domain alpha again unravel that theta domain alpha is pi domain alpha theta bar which is precisely pi g sorry pi uh, pi alpha g pi alpha g theta bar so we are done we have shown that this actually forms a cone so therefore yeah theta bar factors uniquely as e phi for some phi where will that phi be from if you are not totally lost <laughs> phi will be from it will be a limit yeah it will be factorization through the equalizer so from l to l okay so theta bar factors uniquely as e phi for some phi from a to l okay and uh, therefore i have got a i have got l this map is phi then there is some object dj in the diagram and from a to dj i have taken a theta j and from l to dj i have the map pi j e pi j e so i have to show to you that uh, pi j e if this triangle commutes then i'm done for any j so pi j e phi is what e phi is theta bar 
सो पाइजे ऑफ थीटा बार बट पाइजे ऑफ थीटा बार इज एक्चुअली थीटा जे फॉर ऑल जे ओके सो दिस इज द एंड ऑफ दिस लॉन्ग प्रूफ एक्चुअली आई मीन इट फील्स लाइक इट्स अ लॉन्ग प्रूफ एंड इट्स कॉम्प्लिकेटेड बट इट्स नॉट वॉट इट्स ट्राइंग टू टेल यू दैट इन प्रैक्टिस it is sufficient to know whether your category has all products and equalizers then you can conclude that it has got all small limits every limit every arbitrary shape because shapes can be really weird yeah so i gave you some standard shapes and uh, their names in practice people only know those shapes and only those particular limits and colimits people don't know about all general limits and colimits but you don't need to if you know the basic ones the basic ones i have already written down products and equalizers will give you all yeah that's that's what it says and it's a, it's pretty straight forward combinatorial proof what are the steps you know that products and equalizers exist so from any given diagram you construct two massive products and an equalizer diagram you know the equalizer exists so take that equalizer and then show that that equalizer will give you a a cone over the original diagram which happens to be a limit cone you have to verify that it is a limit cone so but notation is heavy yeah so uh, idea is quite simple now let us finish one more part of this proof there is a third part which is much simpler yeah now that uh, we have done this oh by the way yes there is one more thing if i replace all uh, small by finite coproducts then i can get like the same proof will show that all finite products and equalizers will give me all finite limits what is the meaning of finite limit the shape category is finite okay so now the last yes every cardinal yes yes yeah you can do it for any cardinal number so now uh, the last one is quite simple that's uh, if a category c has a terminal object uh, and pullbacks then it has all finite limits yeah terminal plus pullback will give me all finite limits how do i approach the second part of the proof uh, theorem we use the result that we just proved we will try to show that it will have all finite products and equalizers okay what is the meaning of all finite products zero ary product is terminal yes terminal so terminal is already given so we only have to show binary products yeah one ary products are useless it's just the same object so uh, binary products and equalizers okay now this is again uh, like it's very intuitive so mm, the pullback of this particular diagram i am given a and b i know that the terminal exists the terminal is usually denoted by 1 yeah that's our standard notation and there are unique maps to terminal yeah there is no uh nothing different happening that's the proper defining property of this is the product because yeah i mean let me draw the green square again so what happens we have we are given a and b and 1 i am saying a cross b why does this diagram commute in the first place this is pi 1 this is pi 2 
Why does this diagram commute? One is the terminal object. Any two compositions are just going to be equal. And similarly, I can ask you if I am given any arbitrary c with any, any arbitrary f and g, why does this diagram commute? Because again, the idea, same argument, one is terminal object and therefore there must exist a, like this part of the diagram is not playing any role. So therefore, the pullback of this is precisely the product as if there are no restrictions at all. So this is the product and how do you construct equalizers? Yeah, so we are given this particular diagram and you want to construct equalizer of this. So you had to construct a pullback diagram. Pullback of what? F and G. Like uh, are you suggesting this? Let me write it in green. Like this. Or A and A. A and A. Huh. And this is F and G. And then, uh, no, but in general, like if you take the this pullback, then these maps can be different, H and K. These two maps can be different, so you can't do this. But now you have established that you have finite products. So this one doesn't work, okay? But you can do something different, something smarter. We take product of product of A and B, and then what what do we do? Maybe the, there are two solutions, if I remember correctly. Let me show you one. So here we do this. Yeah. So what is the map here? It's identity comma identity and the map here uh, from sorry it's not a cross a it's just a the map here is the pair f comma g b cross b i could construct now you construct the pullback yeah the pullback is this particular map is not really important what is the role of this map let me call this h and this is k so 1b 1b comma k is uh, composed composed with that like 1b 1b composed with k is k comma k yeah and uh, this is what same as fh comma gh so that's all you need yeah uh, so it actually satisfies like fh is equal to gh that's what this diagram tells you and uh, if you use the universal property of the pullback then you will get the universal property of the equalizer you have some other way there is another way definitely but maybe i will leave it as an exercise okay so this part is simple like and use one yeah one above and this will complete the proof of this theorem so which limits are which limit shapes are in important only a certain limit shapes are important even though the proof can look complicated its utility is very high you don't have to rely on know all limits any questions Then let's stop here.